Legacy Precious Metals is the company that I trust to give you good and patient counsel for investing in your retirement. The Biden administration has caused a financial crisis and they have no clue how to fix it. Oil prices have skyrocketed and when oil prices go up, not only do your expenses go up, but the cost of transportation and shipping spikes, leading the prices of goods to rise. And when and we are already seeing record inflation. That's the last thing that we need. Our economy is in trouble and you need to take steps to protect yourself. If all your money is tied up in stocks, bonds, and traditional markets, you may be vulnerable. So gold is one of the very best ways to protect your retirement. No matter what happens, you own your own gold. It's real, it's physical, and it's always been valuable since the dawn of time. Call Legacy Precious Metals today at 866-528-1903 or visit them online at LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com where you can download the free investor's guide. You can also go to my Facebook page, Jenna Ellis. I am a public figure on Facebook and I just posted yesterday a really great interview with the president of Legacy Precious Metals who is discussing why you need to start your retirement account even if you're in your your 20s or 30s. There is always a great time to protect your retirement and invest just like you want to protect your health over the long term. So go to Legacy Precious Metals at LegacyPMInvestments.com or call 866-528-1903. As a constitutional law attorney, former senior legal advisor and personal counsel to President Donald J. Trump, Jenna Ellis believes in the rule of law and the importance of integrity in our elections. And she's ready to tackle the big cultural and legal issues facing America. This is The Jenna Ellis Show. Here is your host, Jenna Ellis. Happy Monday, friends, and welcome to another episode of The Jenna Ellis Show. I'm Jenna Ellis, and I always want to bring you the latest in the legal drama happening around the country, especially with the LGBT agenda that is trying on purpose to indoctrinate our children, often against parents' knowledge or wishes. And so this time, there is a case that's happening out of California, which a lot of these cases tend to be in California because they seem the most crazy. But this time, it is a daycare worker that is actually pushing back against being forcibly compelled to read books that have an LGBT premise to children ages one to five. That is how young the, the the LGBT agenda is trying to indoctrinate kids. It is just disgusting and disturbing. So my good friend, Paul Jana, who is a colleague and special counsel, along with me at the Thomas More Society, the great nonprofit, will join me in just a few minutes. But first, I wanted to give you the legal analysis of President Trump being subpoenaed last week by the January 6th committee. So a lot of you have asked about this over the weekend. And the bottom line with this is no, absolutely not. They have absolutely no authority authority to subpoena a current or past president to sit in front of the committee and explain his rationale or his conversations with uh, any of his staff, his advisors, or his attorneys. So we already know that the January 6th committee is uh, compromised against the um, the House uh, composition requirements. There are no Republicans that were appointed by the, uh, the minority leader. That's why you saw this as a unanimous vote, uh, because clearly there is no one that is opposing them or in any way uh, fighting back that is on the panel. So um, so that those arguments aside that we've already uh, talked about, I want to just talk about the legal precedent in this country that the separation of powers in our U.S. Constitution genuinely matters and must matter in order to survive as a constitutional republic. But this is exactly what the left and especially the January 6th committee is trying to tear down when they are refusing to acknowledge the separation of powers. They're refusing to acknowledge executive privilege, attorney client privilege, no other privileges. So this actually happened uh, at least once before in our nation's history, where a past president was subpoenaed by a committee of the United States House, and that was actually a Democrat president. So Harry Truman was subpoenaed when he was out of office to appear in, pr in front of a House committee and to talk about his decision-making rationale and so forth while he was in office. So this was the letter that he sent as a former president, and remember, he's a Democrat. How Democrats have changed. 
to the chairperson of that committee. He said, quote, it must be obvious to you that if the doctrine of separation of powers and the independence of the presidency is to have any validity at all, it must be equally applicable to a president, a president after his term of office has expired, when it is sought to be examined with respect to any acts occurring while he is president. The doctrine would be shattered, and the president, contrary to our fundamental theory of constitutional government, would become a mere arm of the legislative branch of the government if he would feel during his term of office that his every act might be subject to official inquiry and the possible distortion for political purposes. And he's absolutely right. So this is where the doctrine of the separation of powers requires that the executive is not subordinate or beholden or accountable to the other political branch of government, to the House. Otherwise, why? Truman said rightly that then a current sitting president would be so concerned about what a future House or uh, opposition for political purposes would be that he would essentially become a mere arm of the legislature. Our founders, in their wisdom, intended to separate the powers, and there are coordinate and co-equal branches. So the House oversight committees only have the legislative authority to subpoena. Remember, they are not in any way able to uh, indict, to uh, have any sort of law enforcement authority. They can't set precedent in terms of judicial review like the Supreme Court. Their only authority is to subpoena for the purposes of future legislation. What possible legislation are they even contemplating? This is 100% political, and they are also trying to use these type of subpoenas to then make referrals to the Department of Justice. They're acting like they are part of law enforcement. So this is constitutionally impermissible. And President Trump, in my opinion, absolutely should fight this, should write a similar letter and reference Harry Truman and say for the exact same reasons, absolutely no, that's not okay. And uh, also, though, you have to ask yourself, the timing of this is incredibly suspicious. And I think it smacks merely of partisan politicking when it's about three weeks before the midterm elections. Nobody cares about the January 6th committee. Uh, there was actually a piece in CNN uh, last week that I was just laughing about, that CNN was whining and saying that the majority of Americans care more about the cost of French fries than they do about the January 6th committee. And why is that? Because all Americans are concerned about the rising prices of food. We're concerned about the economy, gas prices, inflation, uh, the war in Ukraine possibly being in um, a, a nuclear situation. I mean, these things are all so much more important than what Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger are doing with their last few days in office. So why is the January 6th committee doing this now? And why is their subpoena request not even until January when they're out of office? Well, the answer to that, I think, is obvious. What the January 6th committee is doing is trying a last minute, desperate attempt to say, hey, Democrats, if you really want to see Trump testify, you better get out and vote and you better vote Democrat so that Democrats can keep the majority in the House and we can keep perpetuating this nonsense of political theater out into the next two years. So this is obviously a political ploy. And it's just intended to affect the midterms, which is so irresponsible. And it's such a waste and misuse of taxpayer money that is actually funding this committee. And Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger should be doing so many more useful things with their last days in office. But, uh, you know, hopefully the, the January 6th committee, once the Republicans do take back the House, which I'm confident that we will, but everyone needs to get out and vote after uh, after November then the the committee will just you know, cease to exist. It'll be closed. And the report the committee has already said that they're going to generate after uh, their, the close of their hearings won't come out until early next year anyway. So hopefully this is kind of the last failed attempt at some kind of theatrical production. But the legal precedent here is very, very important and very concerning because there has been an obvious attempt by all of the Democrat political operatives to try to ignore precedent from our history, our constitution, and even from the judiciary in all types of respects when it deals with Donald Trump. They want to use different rules 
for Donald Trump and anyone associated with him than they do for anyone else. It's almost like they want to carve out uh, these four years of the Trump administration and just say, well, none of the rules, none of the constitutional protections, none of the precedents, nothing applies to that. We just want to get Trump. So we want to carve out this little time that we can be a modern day star chamber and we can go and attack Trump so hard that we finally have a win and we get him, whether it is Spygate, it's Russia collusion, it's the first impeachment, it's the January 6th committee, it's now the Mar-a-Lago raid documents. I mean, all of these things have one goal in mind, simply to get Trump. But that is why conservatives have to still, regardless of what you think about Trump, regardless of who you support, even Democrats who care about this country need to be concerned that precedent is not abolished or ignored when it comes to their political opponents, whose name they're Donald Trump, because they would never want that turned back against them. And of course, Republicans and genuine conservative originalists won't manipulate the law or the constitution simply for political purposes or to uh, simply have political persecutions of their opponents. And I think the Democrats know that. So they're trying to get away with it because they know that we will never play dirty and we actually respect the rules in the constitution. Now, I am still in the camp that we can't change that as constitutional conservatives. We cannot start playing dirty just because the Democrats do. Otherwise, we are helping them dismantle our system of government and the protections that are in the Constitution. But I hope that President Trump and his current lawyers will simply ignore the subpoena. They will uh, possibly have a letter sent to, uh, to to the chairman of the committee. I think that they'll probably wait until after the midterms because it will likely just be a moot point uh, if Republicans do take uh, take the House back. But I've seen a few people uh, suggest that, you know, well, what does he have to hide? Why doesn't he just go and, you know, say, said, that'd be great primetime TV? Well, no, because one, because he would then be, uh, be agreeing that the House has this kind of subpoena authority over past precedents. And let's be honest, no one who is sitting on the January 6th committee actually cares about the truth. They don't care about what Donald Trump actually said or did. All they want is to get Trump. There is absolutely no reason why he should go and give them that type of ability to openly question him. And especially in that context where he would be subordinate to a committee and validating that he is there under subpoena and opening himself up to questions from Liz Cheney and Adam Kinzinger. No, the, the number one rule in any sort of debate setting is unless you are actually um, in an election and you are debating your opponent, now that's fine, regardless of whether you are um, extremely popular and you're winning and your opponent is totally not known, that's the right uh, professional thing to do and that's okay. But in any other context in a debate, if you're Donald Trump, you don't deign to sit in front of that type of a committee in that type of situation. Uh, those types of debates are never fair. And of course, this isn't just a debate, this would be a committee, uh, a January 6th committee, prime time, um, kind of, you know, aired and um, completely produced and overproduced drama. And all they are trying to do is have one sort of misstep so that then they could have a perjury trap or they could have some other contempt citation. It would open him up to a host of other kinds of problems that would just lend, unfortunately, credibility to this sham committee. So I don't see any way legally or under precedent that the committee even has this authority to begin with, or that Donald Trump would actually sit in front of this committee, nor should he. So right after this, we'll get to my good friend, Paul John. All right. Well, 2022 is going to be a critical year for America. AMAC, the Association of Mature American Citizens, along with their nearly 2 million members, the fight to stop out of control spending in the president's Build Back Better scheme is far from over. And Congress is plotting more legislation that could hurt our seniors. The midterm elections will be a battle for freedom versus socialism. Unlike liberal groups, AMAC is America's conservative, action-oriented 50-plus organization 
Nation, fighting hard every day here in Washington and across the nation for our seniors. So I'm urging you to choose AMAC now. You will receive all of the great membership benefits, including AMAC discounts on hotels, travels, and restaurants, and your membership will support your conservative values. So go to amac.us forward slash Ellis. That's amac.us forward slash E-L-L-I-S to become an AMAC member now. Well, as you know, friends, I always like to cover all of the legal drama going around uh, the country, especially in California, where it seems like the pervasive LGBT agenda could not be stronger. But this time, there is a case of a teacher that is actually fighting back and standing up against the woke agenda. So her attorney with the Thomas More Society, my very good friend and colleague, Paul Jana, joins me now to discuss. Paul, thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Jenna. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so what's going on in this case? This is a school teacher that refused actually to read uh, LGBT themed books to kids that wasn't required, it seems like, in uh, the state of California. And so she's actually pushing back, but got terminated over it. Yeah, it's very egregious, actually. So she works at Bright Horizons, which is a private daycare institution, and she's in the Los Angeles location. Um, and the children that she helps are, you know, between one and five years old, little kids. And she's faithfully worked there for four years, a wonderful human being, very, very good lady. She noticed early on uh, that there were books on the shelf uh, that included um, mommy, me and mommy um, and dad and daddy. And these books basically promoting same sex marriage. I guess Bright Horizons has, has for some time, uh, you know, been, been pushing the LGBT agenda and sort of wanting to impose that ideology on young kids. And so she noticed that early on and she asked her uh, her supervisor at the time for an accommodation. She, did, she obviously is a devout Christian, believes that marriage is uh, you know, a lifelong union between a man and a woman. And the last thing on earth she'd want to do is read uh, to little kids uh, about same-sex marriage. So for, for many years, she was given this informal accommodation where she just could distract them and read a different book if they picked up that book on the shelf. Uh, but her supervisors changed over time. And, and more recently, earlier this year, her supervisor, is, uh, who's a lesbian, found out that um, that Nellie uh, Parasinkova did not want to read those books to little kids. And um, basically, as a result of her just expressing that politely and and um, in a very respectful way, they treat her like a criminal. They they told her that same day that she had to leave. They made her wait in the in the um, scorching heat that day was 96 degrees. They told her just to leave the facility. If you cannot celebrate diversity with us, we don't want you here. You can't work here. And um, just terrible, terrible in, in human treatment of this wonderful woman um, who we're now representing in a lawsuit against the institution for religious discrimination and failure to accommodate. And I can touch on that, too. Yeah, and that was actually going to be exactly my next question, because it seems like um, initially she was given the accommodation and then with no legal basis or articulation of why or trying to find some other way to accommodate her, like maybe just removing the books uh, while she was on shift. I mean, it seems like there are a lot of other books that uh, they had in the facility. Uh, there would, would have been some other accommodation possible, but it seems like without notice and without legal justification, they just uh, rescinded this and then uh, suspended her. So what's uh, the legal challenge there? Yeah, so actually it's uh, it was, I was surprised to learn there was only 12 books on the shelf and five of those books were all promoting same-sex marriage in one way or another. And that day that this all surfaced, it was a, it was very hot outside and all the kids were inside and the kids don't know what books are on the shel shelf. They pick up a book and they hand it to her to read. And a lot of times she just distracts them and she'll pick up a different book. And that's how it went for many years. And that day she actually asked, can we actually just remove those five books for my shift from the shelf? And the lady that was there said, sure. And then she ran it by her, the other supervisor who, who basically did all the things I just explained to you. And, and under the law, they're supposed to, um, to make a reasonable accommodation if, a, if an accommodation can be made and doesn't pose an undue burden to an employer. And in this case, there's many employees at this location that'd be happy to read those books to kids. So a very common sense and practical solution is okay, let the, let the devout Christian not be forced to literally read things that completely contradict her faith and let someone else who doesn't mind reading them read them. And they said, no, you have to read them. And if, you, and if you're not willing to celebrate diversity and read them, then, then you're basically going to be terminated. And so what she did was she wrote a formal request for religious accommodation. 
they um, re just rejected it without even any discussion, without any attempt to offer some kind of compromise or, or work something out with her. They basically said, you're either going to read these books or you're out of here. And that's what happened. She said, I'm not going to read those books. They fired her. So wow. the status now is that we filed a lawsuit and uh, we, we've named um, not only Bright Horizons, but also her, the, the supervisor at issue, Katie Callis. Uh, we've sued them for all sorts of things, uh, very, very blatantly illegal conduct that, that they engaged in, uh, wrongful termination, religious discrimination, fa failure to accommodate. So we're just very honored to represent uh, this woman and, and you know fight back against this um, this company that's gotten away with this apparently for way too long. Yeah, and so was was the initial supervisor the same supervisor as the one that then denied the accommodation, or was there a change in management? It seems there was a change in management, and the lady who was in charge at the time, um, apparently she's lesbian, but that doesn't matter. I mean, Nelly, our client, right. loves um, and and respects anyone, regardless of their sexual orientation. She is, um, you know, just a, a wonderful human being, and she's gotten along with her in the past. But apparently, there's no uh, respect for these um, people's beliefs is not a two way street in many mainstream organizations. This is a large. Uh, company, 20,000, I think, employees across the U.S., lots of one of the largest private child care companies in the country. Actually, the day after we filed this lawsuit, we saw a video that they just put, put out. I don't know. The timing seems very coincidental where they're talking about the need to celebrate diversity in the workplace and through these through reading books to kids. You know, th this isn't diversity here. I mean, let's you know, let's be honest. Yeah. I mean, this is one to five year olds who right. really are you know they're impressionable. They are learning facts. They're learning what is uh, what is okay and you know what isn't. I mean, this is not celebrating diversity. This is a a First Amendment sort of case that is um, just like what happened in the Masterpiece Cake Shop case, where the the these types of employers are not okay with genuinely celebrating diversity, which would mean you have a very sincere, devout Christian who objects to uh, speaking this type of, and reading this type of book out loud. So actually speaking these words that go against their sincerely held religious belief. And so for the for an employer here to force a person to speak against their sincerely held religious belief is the flip side that I've always talked about for, you know, viewers on the show know that is also a violation of the First Amendment because it's not just the ability to refrain from, from, um, from speaking things that you don't want to. It's also that no one can force you to speak things affirmatively against your sincerely held religious beliefs. And so you mentioned, Paul, that this is in L.A. County. Um, this is in L.A. And so you and I are very familiar with uh, the, the crazy court system that's there. And so uh, what is your projection on how this is going to go? Has there been any sort of overture from New Horizons to possibly settle this case? Or what's your prediction there? Our prediction is this is going to be an all-out war. This company, it seems like they've made their uh, position clear and known to the world. They're going to, uh, this is the hill they're going to die on. So we're planning to take this all the way. No court will throw this case out. It cannot be thrown out on a demur. It cannot be thrown out on a summary judgment. This case will probably either settle after they lose on summary judgment or will go to trial and we're prepared for that. Um, this is, uh, you know, similar, you mentioned the First Amendment and this is against a private entity, but the analysis is very similar since they have an obligation to, uh, to make an accommodation for this uh, for this per for this lady, our client, who has religious objections. So the analysis is very similar. What they're trying to do is they're trying to indoctrinate kids. They're trying to use the company um, to force policies on employees that are basically amount to indoctrination. I think a lot of parents who send their kids to Bright Horizons are probably completely unaware of what's going on, um, of how far um, this company is going in terms of, of intentionally trying to indoctrinate kids. And they have the right to, you know, to celebrate diversity however they see fit, but they can't force devout Christians to violate their faith or, or lose their job, especially when there's ways to accommodate them. So that's what I think, um, you know, I'm pretty confident about the claims. Uh, I don't see this case settling anytime soon, but we're prepared for, uh, for, a, for a long fight and we're pretty confident in the claims. 
Yeah, well, and it, a reasonable public accommodation seems like, or a religious accommodation rather, seems like that would be uh, very easy to accomplish in this case. And so you're right, this is all just about the viewpoint uh, that is trying to indoctrinate these kids and use these uh, workers and the staff to accomplish that purpose and to indoctrinate them with the worldview and the belief system of uh, these of the managers who are choosing these books specifically and trying to force the workers to read them to the children. And I hope that a lot of parents then who find out about this object. And, you know, that's a great point to say that parents, even if you're dropping your kids who are between one and five off at a daycare and you're thinking, oh, nothing can happen at that age, you need to be aware of what's actually going on um, in these types of daycare facilities. Uh, not, and not just in LA or somewhere that you may expect that they have content like that. You need to be looking everywhere and making sure that as a parent, you are ultimately responsible for what your child is exposed to. So, Paul, in the last few minutes I have here, and I, I really I wish you success, and we're going to be uh, following this case. And um, I, I absolutely uh, just love the Thomas More Society, where I'm a special counsel as well. So you and I are colleagues there. But, um, you know, this is a great nonprofit organization that takes up cases like this. So uh, how can people, if they want to, you know, so many people, ask me, how can I get involved? This is so frustrating and I want to do something. Well, donating to the Thomas More Society is a great way to do just that because you can help with cases like this with donations. And so um, talk a little bit more about that and the mission of the Thomas More Society. So, thanks, Jenna. So the mission of the Thomas More Society is it's a public interest law firm, uh, represents clients pro bono, like this lady, Nellie Paris and Koba does not have to pay a cent to us. Um, we, we defend religious liberty, traditional family values, uh, pro, pro-life uh, organizations and, and individuals. Um, and there's a very, very high demand for um, our services. In fact, we, we routinely turn down more cases than we can take. This was one that we just couldn't uh, stomach to turn down. I mean, it was too, so egregious. But uh, the, the money that goes to Thomas More Society is very well spent. They have a network of lawyers across the U.S. We happen to be in the front lines out here in California where there's as you know, Jenna, from firsthand experience, no shortage of, of a need for lawyers like us. Uh, but uh, they do have uh, lawyers handling cases all across the U.S., winning cases at every level of the courts, trial courts, appellate courts, the Supreme Court. We had, a, as you remember, some Supreme Court wins um, not too long ago. So um, if you Google Thomas More Society, it's the public interest law firm in Chicago. Their website will pop up. There's donate tabs. Um, and it's a wonderful organization. And one last thing I wanted to say is that this this issue with the uh, promoting the the LGBT agenda on little kids is really exploding. We're seeing it with the transgender issues too, and it's no real surprise as to why kids are so confused at these young ages. And um, you know, we're, if if you've got companies like this, and we know p- public institutions as well, pushing this agenda at an early age, causing kids to question their their gender identity causing them to go through harmful operations and treatments. We're dealing with a lot of that too. So there's there's a lot of work to do, but um, the good news is that we are winning cases and um, and and uh, Thomas More Society is a, is a wonderful organization to help in that effort. It is. And, you know, they they help so many people. Uh, Everyone will remember the John MacArthur case out of California. Uh, David uh, Daleiden, the Planned Parenthood um, undercover reporter. I mean, these are just some of the very high profile cases and then ones that maybe don't start as high profile that ultimately get there because the issues are so incredibly important. And so if you go to the website as well for Thomas More Society, then you can see all of the announcements. You can keep up on um, all of the uh, the legal that's happening there and all of the cases and all of the wins. And uh, people like Paul Jana and uh, Chuck Lamondry, um, who is there at your law firm as well, um, you are two of the best advocates that I've been so privileged to work with in California. So thank you so much for your dedication to these types of cases, working with the Thomas More Society and truly fighting for freedom in this country. Um, It's always just so great to catch up with you, Paul. So really appreciate your time today. Thanks. Our pleasure. Thank you, Jenna. Legacy Precious Metals is the company that I trust to give you good and patient counsel for investing in your retirement. The Biden administration has caused a financial crisis and they have no clue how to fix it. Oil prices have skyrocketed and when oil prices go up, not only do your expenses go up, but the cost of transportation and shipping spikes, leading the prices of goods to rise. And when 
and we are already seeing record inflation. That's the last thing that we need. Our economy is in trouble and you need to take steps to protect yourself. If all your money is tied up in stocks, bonds, and traditional markets, you may be vulnerable. So gold is one of the very best ways to protect your retirement. No matter what happens, you own your own gold. It's real, it's physical, and it's always been valuable since the dawn of time. Call Legacy Precious Metals today at 866-528-1903 or visit them online at LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com where you can download the free investor's guide. You can also go to my Facebook page, Jenna Ellis. I am a public figure on Facebook and I just posted yesterday a really great interview with the president of Legacy Precious Metals who is discussing why you need to start your retirement account even if you're in your 20s or 30s. There is always a great time to protect your retirement and invest just like you want to protect your health over the long term. So go to Legacy Precious Metals at LegacyPMInvestments.com or call 866-528-1903. MyPillow is having their biggest sheet sale of the year. You all have helped build MyPillow into the amazing company that it is today. Now Mike Lindell, the inventor and CEO, wants to give back exclusively to you, his listeners. The Percale bed sheet set is available in a variety of colors and sizes, and they are all on sale. So for example, the queen size is regularly priced at $89.98 but is now only $39.98 with our listener promo code Jenna, J-E-N-N-A. So order now because when they're gone, they're gone. The Percale bed sheets are breathable and have a cool and crisp feel. These come with a 10-year warranty and a 60-day money-back guarantee, so don't miss out on this incredible offer. There's a limited supply, so be sure to order now. You can call one 800 564 8475 and use the promo code Jenna or go to mypillow.com forward slash Jenna. You can click on the radio listeners square and use the promo code Jenna. That's J E N N A. Thank you so much to all of Mike Lindell's listeners and listeners of this podcast for making sure to support my pillow and using our exclusive listener promo code Jenna. That's J E N N A.